Chapter 6 The Gathering of the Desert Tribes Chafing under the red tape of army regulations, certain slight differences had arisen between the chiefs at GHQ and independent young lords. His aversion to saluting superiors, for instance, and his general indifference to all traditional military formalities did not exactly increase his popularity with some of the sterner warriors of the old school. In the Arab uprising, Lawrence saw an avenue of escape from his Cairo straitjacket. Ronald Storrs, then Oriental Secretary to the High Commissioner of Egypt, was ordered to make a trip down the Red Sea to Jeddah with messages to Amir Hussein, instigator of the Mecca revolt. Although he had played no part in starting the Hijaz revolution, Lawrence had long realized the possibility of the Arabs helping prick the Kaiser's imperialistic bubble, so he asked permission to take a fortnight's vacation and he has been on that leave of absence ever since. Some of his superiors at the Savoy Hotel in Cairo were delighted at the prospect of getting rid of this altogether too obstreperous upstart shaved tail lieutenant, and his request was granted with alacrity. But Lawrence, contrary to the custom of war-worn veterans on leave, did not go sailing down the Nile to the races at Alexandria or upstream to Luxor to while away his holiday at the Winter Palace. Instead, he accompanied Ronald Storr down the Red Sea. On arrival at Jeddah, Lawrence succeeded in getting permission from Grand Sharif Hussein to make a short journey count camel inland to the camp of Amir Faisal, third son of the Grand Sharif, who was attempting to keep the fires of revolution alive. The Arab cause looked hopeless. There were not enough bullets left to keep the army in gazelle meat, and the troops were reduced to John the Baptist's melancholy desert fare of locusts and wild honey. After exchanging the usual oriental compliments over many sweetened cups of Arabian coffee, the first question Lawrence asked Faisal was, When will your army reach Damascus? The question evidently nonplussed the emir, who gazed gloomily through the tent flap at the bedraggled remnants of his father's army. Insha'Allah, replied Faisal, stroking his beard. There is neither power nor might, save in Allah, the high, the tremendous. May he look with favor upon our cause. But I fear the gates of Damascus are farther beyond our reach at present than the gates of paradise. Allah willing, our next step will be an attack on the Turkish garrison at Medina, where we hope to deliver the tomb of the Prophet from our enemies. A few days with Amir Faisal convinced Lawrence that it might be possible to reorganize this rabble into an irregular force which might be of assistance to the British army in Egypt and Sinai. So absorbed did he become in working out this idea that when his two weeks furlough came to an end, he stayed on in Arabia without even sending apologies to Cairo. From then onward, Lawrence was the moving spirit in the Arabian Revolution. When Lieutenant Lawrence arrived, the situation was critical. The Turks had rushed an army corps down from Syria to strengthen Medina, and they had sent down mule and camel transport, armored cars, aeroplanes, cavalry, and more artillery with which to stamp out the revolution. An expeditionary force from Medina was already on its way south to recover Mecca and hang the rebel leaders higher than Haman. To be sure, this advancing army had 250 miles of desert to cross, but they would have crossed it had not strange events occurred, causing them hurriedly to revise their plans. As the Arab chroniclers recount, the hosts of Othman, the minions of the usurper Caliphs, advanced defiantly, but God was not with them. Praise be to Allah, the protector of all those who trust in him. Lawrence had no definite plan, but the thought was in his mind to devise a way of harassing the Turk and attracting the attention of a portion of the Ottoman forces opposing the British to the north in Sinai. He had startled Faisal with the remark that he believed his troops would be in Damascus within two years. If Allah wills, had replied the emir with a dubious smile, as he stroked his beard and gazed at his riffraff army lolling in the shade of the date palms. But something in Lauren's quiet manner impressed him with confidence, and he accepted the offer to cooperation. To the young archaeologist turned soldier, the thought of participating in the desert war appealed greatly. Here he saw an opportunity not only of beating the Germans, but of testing the theories of the great military experts whose books had so fascinated him. 
Once he had made up his mind to help the Arabs, Lawrence was immediately transformed from a scholarly student of the metaphysical and philosophical side of war to a student of the stern realities. To reach Mecca, he thought the Turkish expedition would first attempt to drive Faisal's force out of the hills in order to capture Rabe, the tiny but strategically important Red Sea port 100 miles north of Jeddah. Here, behind coral reefs, under a picturesque grove of palm trees, were excellent wells. Lawrence's first plan was to supply the Bedouin regulars in the hills between Medina and Rabe uh, with modern rifles and plenty of ammunition in the hope that they would be able to hold up the advancing Turks in the narrow defiles until a regular army of Arab townsmen more amenable to discipline could be whipped into shape. Next, he planned to entrench them outside Rabay, where they could cooperate with the British fleet and give battle to the enemy when the latter finally broke through the hills. The Turks, however, upset the scheme with alarming speed. Much sooner than anticipated and without warning, they pushed straight through the hills as though the Bedouin regulars were not there. The situation now was even more precarious than when Lawrence first arrived. It seemed to the Arabs as though the maker of the sun and moon and stars were guiding the destiny of the enemy. It was at this stage in the campaign that Lawrence decided to disregard Folk's dictum that the object of modern war is to locate the enemy army and annihilate it. He came to the conclusion that to win a war against the Turks, or any other well-trained troops in the desert, it would be better to imitate the tactics of Hannibal and other military leaders of pre-Napoleonic wars. He realized that in a stand-up fight against the better disciplined Turks, the Arabs would be doomed. On the other hand, he figured that if Hussein's followers confined themselves exclusively to the hit-and-run type of guerrilla warfare to which they were so thoroughly accustomed, the Turks would be helpless to retaliate. The failure of his first plan opened Lawrence's eyes, and the situation as he now saw it resolved itself to this. Sharif Hussein's followers had captured Mecca, the most important city of the Hijaz. They had also taken Taif and Jeddah, and had swept the hated Turk from the whole of their country, with the exception of the city of Medina and the fortified posts protecting the Hijaz railway, connecting Medina with Damascus. In other words, the Arabs were already in possession of all of their country with the exception of a very small part. Furthermore, the Turkish garrisons of Medina along the Hijar Railway could not move easily from their base without the consent of the Arabs, for they were surrounded by that mysterious element to which they were not accustomed, the unknown and unfathomable desert. An army corps of Turkish infantry would be as helpless in the desert as they would be at sea. On the other hand, the Arabs were at home among the shifting dunes. When a Bedouin tribe starts off on a raid, each man and his camel are a separate unit, each desert warrior an independent as a warship at sea. There are no lines of communication. Mounted on his racing camel, a Bedouin can cruise across the desert sands for weeks without returning to his base of supply. The dictum of a Bedouin strategist is quite contradictory to the dictum of martial folk. His theory is not to hunt out his enemy and fight it out to the finish, but to stalk his prey as a hunter stalks his game. At an unguarded moment, he sweeps down upon him, accomplishes his mission, and then, before his opponent has time to collect his wits, he vanishes, swallowed up by the trackless sands. This was the game Lawrence decided to play, for all it might be worth. When he came to this decision, he was lying in his tent, stricken with a fever, and the Turkish expeditionary force was bearing rapidly down upon Rabe. Instead of strengthening the system of trenches around the port and awaiting them, Lawrence and Faisal started north, leaving Sharif Hussein's youngest son, Zaid, with a small band of Bedouins to harass the enemy. This left Jeddah and Mecca practically unprotected and gave the Turkish army a clear right of way. What was Lawrence's scheme? To the north were two small ports, Yenbo and Elway. These were still held by the Turks as a protection for the Hijar Railway, the life cord both of the Medina garrison and of the Turkish army marching south on Mecca. His plan was to capture both of these important boats. 
threaten the railway and compel the enemy expeditionary force to return to Medina, or run the risk of being cut off in the desert without supplies. The more Lawrence thought about this, the more he became convinced that if the Turkish expedition could be drawn back to Medina, the Arab war would be won at any rate, one so far as the liberation of the Shah was concerned. He estimated that there were about 150,000 square miles of territory in the country, and that if the Turks wanted completely to subjugate it, and to stamp out all revolution, they would need at least half a million soldiers. Since they had a maximum of only 100,000 troops for the purpose, Lawrence concluded that if he could succeed in welding the scattered inhabitants of the desert into an army, he might be able not only to drive the Turks from Holy Arabia, but to invade Syria as well. To do this, he must convince them that they should give up cutting each other's throats over century-old tribal disputes. He must convince them that, instead, they must risk their lives for the freedom of their country, and that they should die willingly for the liberation of the whole Arab world from Ottoman oppression. The general staff at headquarters in Cairo raised no objection to Lawrence remaining in Arabia when he failed to return at the end of his furlough. General Sir Gilbert Clayton, head of the Intelligence Corps, knew that he could speak the language, that he understood the people, and indeed that he was something of a Bedouin at heart himself. GHQ merely hoped that he might encourage the Arabs a little and help keep the rebellion alive. They gave him complete freedom of action in order that he might make the most of any opportunities that might arise. That was in October 1916. And by October 1918, this youngster, not yet out of his twenties, had raised a formidable, vaporous, irregular army, and had led it through the gates of Damascus. It was by the process of accretion that Lawrence and Faisal built up their army. With only two companions, the former started out across the desert. He stopped at every nomad encampment, and calling the headmen together, in faultless classic Arabic, he explained his mission. The fact that Lawrence was visiting them in the name of Sidi Faisal, of the most beloved of Sharif Hussein's sons, ensured him against personal harm, in spite of the fact that he was a Christian trespassing on sacred ground. At nightfall, after prayers, he would sit by the campfires before the black tents, discussing with his Bedouin hosts the past greatness of Arabia and her present condition of servitude until he had every member of the tribe worked up to a high pitch of frenzy. Over roasted goat killed in his honor, and cups of sweetened tea, in phrases more eloquent than the words of the tribal wise men, he would discuss with them the possibility of driving out the Turks. He convinced them that they would be flying in the face of Allah if they hesitated longer, since their ancient enemy was at the moment too busy fighting the British, French, Italians, and Russians to offer serious resistance to an Arab uprising. Then he succeeded in persuading the Bedouins to renounce their blood feuds and unite against their common enemy, it was demonstrated by the fact that within six months he had united nearly all the tribes of the Jah into a loose alliance. The first three tribes won over were the Harb, who inhabit the desert between Medina and Mecca, the Juhena, who dwell in the region between the Red Sea coast and Medina, and the people of the Billy tribe, who roam the country east of Elwe. The first of these includes over 200,000 people and is one of the largest tribes in all Arabia. Throughout the entire first phase of the desert campaign, the Arabs were given invaluable assistance by the British Navy, while Lawrence trekked north through the interior, encouraging and supervising the gathering of the clans. Faisal left the Mecca road undefended and started up the coast, accompanied by every man available, except the few snipers who remained with Sharif Zaid. By the time Faisal had advanced within striking distance of Yanbo, the first port north of Rabe, Lawrence had sent several thousand more tribesmen to his support. The Turkish garrison evacuated before the Arabs arrived, the guns of the British warships causing them to take to their heels. The entry into Yanbo was splendid and barbaric, Emir Faisal, as commander-in-chief of the Arabian army, rode in front, dressed in robes as white as the snows of Lebanon. On his right rode another Sharif, garbed in dark red, his headcloth, tunic, and cloak, dyed with henna. On Faisal's left rode Sharif Lawrence in pure white robes, looking like the reincarnation of a prophet of old. Behind them were Bedouins carrying three large banners of purple silk, topped with gold spikes, 
and followed by a minstrel twinging a lute and three drummers playing a weird march. After them came a bouncing, billowy mass of thousands of wild sons of Ishmael on camels, all members of Faisal's and Lauren's bodyguard. They were packed together in a dense throng as they passed down the corridor of palm trees under the minarets of the mosque. The riders were wearing robes of every color, and from their saddles hung gay trappings and rich brocades. It was indeed a resplendent cavalcade. All were singing at the tops of their nasal voices, improvising verses descriptive of the virtues of Amir Faisal and his fair-haired Grand Vizier. All were singing at the tops of their nasal voices, improvising verses descriptive of the virtues of Amir Faisal and his fair-haired Grand Vizier. From Yenbo, they had once pushed on north along the coast for another 200 miles toward El Wey, which was held by a thousand Turkish troops. The name of this port recalls to mind another expedition. About 24 BC, Augustus Caesar sent Alias Gaius to Arabia with 11,000 of the picked soldiers of Rome. After wandering for six months through the thirst-stricken land, they finally gave up their attempt to reach the Frankincense country, and when they sailed back to Egypt from this same port of El Wey, there was but a sorry remnant left. They had learned to their grief what Lawrence already knew, that an army in Arabia must be able to endure much and live on little. By now, Lawrence and Faisal had collected 10,000 men, and this force was divided into nine sections. They converged at the village of Umle, about halfway. There they received fresh supplies from the British warships with whom perfect liaison was maintained through the entire coastal operations. From Umle on the north, 120 miles of waterless desert lay before the Arab army. So barren was this region that there were not even thorns on which the camels might subsist. But an armed merchantman of the Indian Merchant Marine followed up the coast, ran the risk of ripping wide her hull on hidden coral reefs, and put into an uncharted bay with a small quantity of water for the mules, but none for the camels. Hundreds of the latter were lost, but the army reached the hills overlooking Elway on January 25th, 1917, without the loss of a single man from hunger and thirst. Elway stands at the southwestern corner of a small coralline plateau, bounded on the west by the sea, on the south by a dry wadi, and on the east by an inland plain. The British warships bombarded the Turks out of their main fortress by firing from 14,000 yards, which enabled them to keep far outside the range of the Turkish guns. After shelling them for a few hours, a landing party of Arabs, who had been carried up by sea for the purpose, went ashore and attacked the demoralized garrison. At the same time, Lawrence and his men swept in from the desert and took a hand both in the street fighting and the looting. True to tradition, Lawrence Bedouins made off with every movable object in El Way. Admiral Sir Rosalind Wemyss directed the sea attack in person. To use the Arab phrase, Admiral Wemyss was the father and mother of the Arabian Revolution during its early stages. Much of the credit for the early success of the Arabs should go to him. Whenever Lawrence wanted to stage a cinema show, as he described demonstrations made to impress the rather restive Arabs, who were too much inclined to revert to their old habit of fighting among themselves, he would simplify, simply notify the Admiral, who would steam down from Suez in his huge flagship, the Urialis, and engage in target practice with his nine-inch guns along the coast within sight of the Sharifian army. On two occasions, the Admiral anchored the Urialis in Jeddah Harbor at critical moments, ostensibly to present his compliments to the Grand Sharif. There is no doubt that the mammoth size of the Admiral's flagship was largely responsible for the impression which the aged monarch gained of Britain's power. She is the great sea in which I, the fish, swim, he remarked on one occasion. And the larger the sea, and the fatter the fish. Chapter 7 The Battle at the Wells of Abu el Lasal. Simultaneously with Faisal's attack on the small red sea ports of Yenbo and El Wey, his brother Abdullah appeared out of the desert several miles to the east, near Medina. He was accompanied by a riding party mounted on she-racing camels. 
These raiders wiped out a few enemy patrols, blew up several sections of track, and left a formal letter tacked in full view on one of the sleepers and addressed to the Turkish commander-in-chief, describing in redundant and lurid detail what his fate would be if he lingered longer in Arabia. The Turkish forces advancing on Mecca received news of the fall of Yenbo and el more than a hundred miles to the northwest of them, and of Sharif Abdullah's raids a hundred miles to the northeast, at almost the same moment. They were amazed and bewildered, for a few days previously the Arab army had been sitting in front of the Mitrabe. Thanks to the sniping of Amir Zaid's handful of followers by day, and to small raids by night, the Turks had been tricked into thinking the main Hejah army still there, but now there appeared to be Arab armies on all sides of them. The relentless rays of the sun beating down with blistering ferocity on the parched region where they encamped not only increased their thirst, but stimulated their imagination as well. To their feverish, sunken eyes, every mirage now seemed to be a cloud of Bedouin horsemen. Each hour brought camel couriers with news of raids on El Ula, Medain Chalet, and the other stations north of Medina, and of the capture of two more of the Red Sea garrisons at Daba and Moela. Thoroughly frightened by the news of these unexpected reverses, as well as by the rumors of fictitious Arab victories circulated purposely among them by Lauren's secret agents, the Turks, panic-stricken, fled back to defend their base in Medina and to defend the railway, which was their sole line of communication with Syria and Turkey. In the north of Holy Arabia, near the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, the Turks had another garrison far more important than any as yet taken in the campaign, except the garrisons at Mecca and Jeddah. Before Faisal's followers could hope to sweep their ancient enemy out of all of the Hijaz, excepting Medina, this important stronghold at the head of the Gulf must be accounted for. This accomplished, Lawrence had in mind a far bolder and vaster plan which he hoped to execute. Of all the strategic places along the west coast of Arabia and north of Aden, the most important from a military standpoint is the ancient seaport of Aqaba, once the chief naval base of King Solomon's fleet. Also one of the first places where the Prophet Muhammad preached and made his headquarters, for any army attempting to invade Egypt or strike at the Suez Canal from the east, Aqaba must be the left flank as it must be the right flank for any army setting out from Egypt to invade Palestine and Syria. From the beginning of the war, the Turks had maintained a large garrison there, both because they intended to wrest Egypt from the British, and because it was essential to the security of the Hijar Railway. It was Lawrence's intention to capture Aqaba and make it the base for an Arab invasion of Syria. This was a truly ambitious and portentous plan. On June 18, 1917, with only 800 Bedouins of the Tuwaya tribe, 200 of the Shehrat, and 90 of the Kawachiba, he set out from El Way for the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, 300 miles farther north. This force was headed by Sharif Nasir, a remote descendant of Mohammed and one of Faisal's ablest lieutenants. As usual, Lawrence went along to advise the Arab commander. He always made it a point to act through one of the native leaders, and much of his success may be attributed to his tact in making the Arabs believe that they were conducting the campaign themselves. The advance on Aqaba is an illustration of how ably Lawrence handled Faisal's army, in spite of his complete lack of military training and experience. In order to outwit the Turkish commander of Medina, he led a flying column nearly 1,000 miles to the north of El Way, but instead of going right up the coast toward Aqaba, he led them far into the interior, across the Hijar Railway, not far from Medina, where they blew up several miles of track on the way, then through the Wadi Siran, famous for its venomous reptiles, where some of his men died of snakebite, then across the territory of the Hoetat tribe east of the Dead Sea, and still on north into the land of Moab. He even led a party of picked men through the Turkish lines by night, dynamited a train near Amman, the ancient Greek city of Philadelphia, blew up a bridge near Dera, the most important railway junction just south of Damascus, and mined another several hundred miles behind the Turkish front-line trenches near the Syrian industrial city of Holm. 
It was possible for Lawrence to conduct raids on such a grand scale only because of the extraordinary mobility of his forces. With his Camel Corps, he could cruise across the desert for six weeks without returning to his supply base. As long as the members of his party kept to the desert and out of sight of the Turkish fortified posts along the frontiers of Palestine and Syria, they were as safe as though they were on another planet. When they saw an opportunity to dash in and make a surprise attack, they would do so, and then dash back into the desert where the Turks dared not follow, because they neither had the camels, the intimate knowledge of the desert, nor the phenomenal powers of endurance which the Bedouins possessed. During a six-week expedition, Lauren's followers would live on nothing but unleavened bread. Each man carried a half-sack of flour weighing forty-five pounds, enough to enable him to trek two thousand miles without obtaining fresh supplies. They could get along comfortably on a mouthful of water a day when on the march, but wells were rarely more than two or three days' march apart, so that they seldom suffered from thirst. For these expeditions far to the north and within territory occupied by the Turks, Lawrence divided his men into several different raiding parties in order to confuse and bewilder the enemy. After annoying them in the hills of Moab to the east of Jericho, then a day or two later, way up around Damascus, he swept south again. It is sixty miles from Aqaba to the Hijar Railway, and in order to prevent the Turks from guessing that Aqaba was his real objective, he made a feint against Man the most important fortified town on the railway between Medina and the Dead Sea. At the same time, seventeen miles southwest of Man, he swooped down upon Fuela Station and wiped out its garrison. When news of this reached the Turks at Man, they dispatched one of their crack-mounted regiments in pursuit, but when the regiment reached the station, only the vultures were found in possession. Lawrence and his raiders had disappeared into the blue again, and, so far as the Turks knew, had been swallowed up by the desert. But, lest they should be forgotten, on the evening of the following day they reappeared out of the mist, many miles distant. There they merrily planted more mines, demolished a mile of track, and destroyed a relief train. The heat during those July days was intense. In describing it, Lawrence remarked that the burning ground seared the skin from the forearms of the snipers, and the camels went as lame as the men did, with agony from the ambushed or from the sunburned flints. By this time, Lawrence and Sharif Nasir had been joined by the Beniatia tribe, who supplied them with four thousand fresh fighting men, and also by the Abu Tayy section of the Hoitat tribe, made up of some of the finest warriors in Arabia under the leadership of Ahoda, a veritable human tiger who was Lawrence's intimate companion from then onward. The pursuing Turkish column decided to spend the night in the bottom of a valley near some wells at Abu el Asal, fourteen miles from Mam, where I camped with Lawrence and Faisal some months later. Lawrence, in the meantime, left his column and galloped off across the desert to see if he could locate the Turkish battalion. As soon as he found it, he hurried back for his men, brought them on to the heights around Abu el Asal, and by dawn had the Turks completely surrounded. For twelve hours the Arabs sniped at the Turks from their positions on the hills around the wells, picking off many of them. The Sultan's forces were indeed in a tight corner, but Lawrence knew full well that if they were under capable and daring leaders, they could easily fight their way out through his thin line of Bedouins. The Turk commander, however, lacked the necessary courage, so at sunset, Auda, Abi Tai, with fifty of his fellow tribesmen, crept up to within three hundred yards of the Turks, and, after a moment's rest, boldly pushed out from under cover and galloped straight into the enemy camp. So surprised were the Turks by this audacity that when the old Bedouin chieftain crashed in their midst, their ranks broke, but not before bullets had smashed out of Abu Tayy's field glasses, pierced his revolver holster, nicked the sword he was holding in his hand, and killed two horses under him. In spite of these incidents, the old Arab was delighted and maintained afterward that it was the best scrap he had had since Ramadan. 
Lawrence, who was watching from the hill on the opposite side of the basin, dashed down the slope as fast as his dromedary could carry him and charged into the midst of the now demoralized Turks, followed by four hundred other Bedouins on camels. For twenty minutes a thousand Turks and Arabs were mixed together in a wild, frenzied mass, all shouting madly. In the charge, Lawrence accidentally shot his own camel through the head with his automatic. It dropped dead, and he was hurled from his saddle and lay stunned in front of it, while his followers charged right over him. Had he not been thrown directly in front of his mount, he would have been trampled to death by the onrushing camels. The Turks made their fatal error in scattering, just as Lawrence had surmised they would do, and the battle ended in massacre. Although many escaped in the darkness, the Arabs killed and captured more than the total number of their own force. The next morning, more than 300 dead were counted around the waterhole. Most of the prisoners taken were rounded up by Sharif, Nazir, and Lawrence, because the rest of the Bedouins dashed off to the Turkish tents, as usual, thinking of nothing but loot. The desire to loot is an all-consuming passion with the Bedouin, and is not considered a form of stealing by them, but is listed among the cardinal virtues. So bitter were the Arabs that they wanted to kill their prisoners in retaliation for the atrocities the Turks had been committing against their women and children. They were also aching to avenge the death of Sheikh Belgawiya of Krak, one of their leaders, whom the Turks had harnessed between four mules and torn apart limb from limb. The Sheikh's tragic death had been the climax of a series of executions by torture, which had so enraged the Arabs that they swore never to give quarter to another Turk. But Lawrence had other ideas. He wanted the rumor spread far and wide to the Turkish army that the Arabs were not only accepting prisoners, but were treating them well. And so he finally prevailed upon his revengeful followers to treat these captives with special consideration. Just as he had hoped, this propaganda brought immediate results, and in the days following the Battle of Abu al-Dasal, groups were constantly coming in, holding their weapons above their heads and crying, Muslim! Muslim, in imitation of the German cry of Kamarat. Chapter 8 The Capture of King Solomon's Ancient Seaport Lawrence had left El hundreds of miles to the south, with but two months' rations. After giving a part of his supplies to the captured Turks, the food situation became critical. Nevertheless, the half-starved Arab army, led by this youngster, continued its march through the jagged, barren mountains that bite the North Arabian sky. The news of their victories traveled ahead of them, and when Lawrence arrived at Gera, a Turkish post in King Solomon's Mountains, twenty-five miles from Akaba, at the entrance to an extremely narrow pass known as the Wadi Etham, the Gera garrison came out and laid down their arms without firing a shot. He then proceeded to march his Bedouins on, down the Wadi Yitham to Kethra, another outpost guarding the only land approach to Aqaba. There Lawrence charged another garrison and captured several hundred more men. Trekking through the gorge, they came to an ancient wall at Kadra, where two thousand years before the Romans had constructed a stone dam across the valley, the remains of which can still be seen. The Turks had massed their heavy artillery behind that ruined wall. It constituted the outermost defense of Aqaba. By the time the Sharifian army arrived in front of this final barricade, the Bedouins of the Amran Drausha and Nawat tribes, who lived in the desert near Aqaba, had heard of the great victories at Fuela and Abu el-Lasal, and were scampering across the lava mountains by the hundreds to join the advancing Arab forces. The overwhelming defeat of the Turkish battalion at Abu el-Lasal was really the first phase of the Battle of Aqaba. The second consisted in the spectacular maneuver when Lawrence accomplished what the Turks thought impossible and succeeded in leading his scraggly, undisciplined horde of Bedouins through the precipitous King Solomon Mountains, over the old Roman wall, right past the bewildered Turkish artillerymen, and down into Aqaba on the morning of July 6, 1917. But to save the Aqaba garrison from massacre, Lawrence and Nasir had to labor with their fierce followers from sunset to dawn. They would not have succeeded then had not Nasir walked down the valley into no man's land and sat on a rock to make his men quit firing. 
Aqaba is picturesquely located at the southern end of the wide Wadi Araba, perhaps the driest and most desolate valley in the world, which runs down from the Dead Sea to the Gulf of Aqaba. Up this same Wadi, Moses and the Israelites are believed to have made their way toward the Promised Land, and down this valley rode Mohammed, Ali, Abu Bakir, and Omar. It was here that Mohammed preached many of his first sermons. Beyond a narrow semicircle of date palms which fringed the shore lie the blue waters of the now deserted Gulf where Solomon's fleets, Phoenician galleys, and Roman triremes rode at anchor. Behind Aqaba loomed jagged, volcanic, arid mountains. Like most of the smaller towns of the Near East, the place itself is a chaotic jumble of mud huts. Awnings cover the narrow streets, and the stalls in the bazaar are filled with brocades, shabby prayer rugs, cones of cane sugar swarming with flies, piles of dates, and dishes of glistening brass and hammered copper. The Turks and Germans were so paralyzed, bewildered, by the unexpected achievement of the Arabs in getting across the mountains and through the passes, that they surrendered without further ado. Immediately after the entrance into Aqaba, a German officer stepped up and saluted Lawrence. He spoke neither Turkish nor Arabic, and evidently did not even know there was a revolution in progress. "'What is this all about? What is this all about? Who are these men?' He shouted excitedly. They belonged to the army of King Hussein. The Grand Sharif had by this time proclaimed himself king, who is in revolt against the Turks, replied Lawrence. Who is King Hussein? asked the German. Emir of Mecca and ruler of this part of Arabia, was the reply. Ah, Himmel! And what am I? added the German officer in English. You are a prisoner. Will they take me to Mecca? No, to Egypt. Is sugar very high over there? Very cheap. Good. And he marched off, happy to be out of the war, and happier still to be heading for a place where he could have plenty of sugar. This time the plans of Amir Faisal's youthful British advisor went through true to form. From now on the Turks were kept on the defensive. They were obliged to weaken their army by splitting it into two parts. One half remained in Medina, and the other defended the pilgrimage railway. If he had wanted to do so, Lawrence could have dynamited the railway. So many places that the Turks would have been completely cut off at Medina. Then, by bringing up a few long-range naval guns from the Gulf of Aqaba, he could have blown Medina off the map and compelled the garrison to surrender. But he had an excellent reason for not attempting this, as we shall soon see. In his mind he had worked out a far finer and more ambitious scheme, the successful carrying out of which demanded that the Turks should be inveigled into sending down more reinforcements to Medina, and as many guns, camels, mules, armored cars, aeroplanes, and other war materials as they could be compelled to part with from their other fronts. He hoped they would keep a huge garrison there until the end of the war, which would mean so many less Turks opposing the British army than Palestine and Mesopotamia, and the supply trains which would necessarily have to be sent down from Syria, might be made a constant source of supply for the Arabs. If Medina were captured and the Turks all driven north, it would deprive Lawrence of this magnificent opportunity of maintaining his army on Turkish supplies. That was far more to his advantage than occupying Medina. After the capture of Aqaba, Lawrence and his men lived for ten days on unripe dates and on the meat of camels which had been killed in the Battle of Abu Lasal. They were compelled to kill their own riding camels at the rate of two a day to save themselves and their hundreds of prisoners. Then, in order to keep his army from starving, Lawrence jumped on his racing camel and rode her continuously for twenty-two hours across the uninhabited mountains and desert valleys of the Sinai Peninsula. Completely worn out after this record ride, which came at the end of two months' continuous fighting and a thousand miles of trekking across one of the most barren parts of the earth, and living on soggy unleavened bread and dates, and without having a bath for more than a month, he turned his camel over to an MP at one of the street corners in Port Tufik, Suez, walked a little unsteadily into the Sinai Hotel, and ordered a bath. 
For three hours, he remained in the tub with a procession of Berberine boys serving him cool drinks. That day, he declares, was the nearest approach to the Mohammedan idea of paradise that he ever expects to experience. From Suez, he went on to Ismailia, the midway station on the canal. Lawrence's arrival in Arabia had been unheralded. Even GHQ and Cairo were ignorant as to his movements. His exploits first became known when he met General Allenby at Ismailia on the arrival of the new leader, who had just been assigned to take over command of the Egyptian Expeditionary Forces. The incident was dramatic in its simplicity. Allenby had been sent out from London to succeed Sir Archibald Murray as Commander-in-Chief. He had just landed and was at the railway station in Ismailia, walking up and down the platform with Admiral Wemyss. Lawrence, standing nearby in Arab garb, saw the important-looking general with the admiral. "'Who's that?' he asked of Wemyss' flag lieutenant. "'Allenby,' was the reply. "'What's he doing here?' queried Lawrence. "'He has come to take out Murray's place.' Lawrence was frightfully pleased. A few minutes later, Lawrence had an opportunity to report to Admiral Wemyss, who had been the godfather of the Arab show. He told him that Aqaba had been taken, but that his men were badly in need of food. The Admiral immediately promised to send ships, and a moment later he told Allenby what Lawrence had said. The general sent for him at once. The station was crowded with staff officers and a throng of vociferous natives who were welcoming Allenby, when out of the mob stepped this barefooted, fair-faced boy in Bedouin garb. "'What news have you brought?' asked Allenby. In even, low tones, without any more expression on his face than if he were conveying compliments from the Grand Sharif, Lawrence reported that the Arabs had captured the ancient seaport at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. He gave all the credit for the victory to the Arabs, making no reference to the part he himself had played in the affair. He conveyed the impression that he was acting as a courier, although, as a matter of fact, the capture of that important point was due entirely to his own leadership and strategical genius. The general was immensely pleased, because Aqaba was the most important point on his right flank, and the principal Turkish base on the western coast of the Arabian Peninsula. Then, when Lawrence explained in more detail the plight of the Arab troops, Admiral Wemyss promised to send a vessel filled with food to Aqaba. But Sir Roslin went even beyond that, and acted in a way that will immortalize him in Arabian history. The Arabs were afraid lest the Turks should return with reinforcements and capture Aqaba, so the Admiral moved his office, all his personal effects, and his staff ashore to a hotel in Ismailia, and sent his flagship round Sinai to Aqaba for a whole month to bolster up the morale of the Arabs. The presence of this huge floating fortress encouraged the Bedouins and convinced them that they were not going to be obliged to play a lone hand against the Turkish Empire. The British flagship was more tangible evidence of the strength of Britain than these desert nomads had ever seen before. Had Ruemis also lent Lawrence and his Arabs twenty machine guns from his ships and several naval guns. The latter are still somewhere in Arabia, probably mounted on the roof of Al Abu Taiz mud palace. Several months after the termination of the war, Lawrence received a letter from the Admiralty asking him kindly to return one of the long-range guns which had been taken ashore for the Arab show. He replied that he was sorry, but that he had mislaid it. As a result of Lawrence's victory at Aqaba and his visit to Egypt, the British decided to back the Arabs to the limit in their campaign to win complete independence. The young archaeologist was sent back to Aqaba with unlimited resources, and within a few months he had conducted the campaign in such a brilliant manner that he was raised in rank from lieutenant to lieutenant colonel, despite the fact that he hardly knew the difference between right incline and present arms. The Germans and the Turks were not long in finding out that there was a mysterious power giving inspiration to the Arabs. Through their spies, they discovered that Lawrence was the guiding spirit of the whole Arabian Revolution. They offered rewards up to 50,000 pounds for his capture, dead or alive. But the Bedouins would not have betrayed their leader for all the gold in the fabled mines of Solomon. The fall of Aqaba, next to the capture of the holy city of Mecca, was the most significant event of the Arabian Revolution, 
because it unified the Arabs whom Lawrence had already won over to the cause of the revolution and gave them confidence in themselves. After winning his victory, Lawrence was shrewd enough to take full advantage of it, although his own strategy and personal bravery had played an all-important part in the success of these operations. He was astute enough to give all the credit to the principal Arab leaders under him, such as Auda Abu Tayy and Sharif Nasir. Like children, these doughty old warriors were not at all reticent about accepting it, and of course, from then on, they were Lawrence's sworn friends. Anxious to make the most of this initial success, Lawrence sent couriers to all the tribes of the desert, although news of the Battle of Abu al Sal and advance in Aqaba seemed to travel as though flashed about Arabia by radio. He realized the tremendous importance of propaganda and sent some of his cleverest Arab lieutenants through the enemy lines to spread the news of the fall of Aqaba far and wide to the remote corners of the Turkish Empire. So it was that as young Britain, just down from Oxford, away in a long forgotten corner of the earth, captured the ancient seaport of Solomon where a battle had probably not been fought for a thousand years and more. Thereby, thereby winning the second important victory of the war in the land of the Arabian Nights and paving the way for an invasion of Syria. From a mere local squabble, Lawrence's victory at Aqaba transformed the Hijaz revolt into a campaign of far-reaching importance directed against the heart of the Turkish Empire. And from that day, his undisciplined, rabbitous, swarthy desert brigands became the right wing of Allenby's army. And from then on, the second lieutenant played the role of Lieutenant General. Chapter 9 Across the Red Sea to Join Lawrence and Faisal Emir Faisal and Colonel Lawrence had got as far as Aqaba with their campaign when Mr. Chase and I arrived from the Palestine front with our battery of cameras. It was by no means an easy matter even to get to the Arab base camp, and our adventures in doing so may even justify another digression from the story of Lawrence and his associates in order to better illustrate how remote this campaign really was from the rest of the World War. Shortly after I had met Lawrence in Jerusalem while lunching with General Allenby and the Duke of Connaught, the name of the archaeologist turned soldier came up during the conversation. Out of curiosity, I asked the commander-in-chief why the Arabian campaign and Lawrence's exploits had been kept such a secret. He replied that it had been considered advisable to say as little as possible, because they hoped that large numbers of the conscript Arabs fighting the Turkish army might desert and join Sharif Hussein in his fight for Arabian independence. They were afraid lest the Arabs of Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia, whom the Turks had conscripted, should get the mistaken idea that the Allies were inspiring the Hijaz revolt, and hence erroneously conclude that it was not a patriotic rebellion. For this reason, the Allies were anxious that the campaign should appear in its true light as an independent Arabian movement. But so successful had been Lawrence's efforts that Allenby said it was no longer quite so necessary to maintain such strict secrecy, adding that if I happened to be interested in what was going on in Arabia, he would be glad to have me join King Hussein's army and afterward tell the world a little of what the Arabs had done toward helping to win the Great War. This was exactly what I had often thought of asking permission to do, but I had been warned that because of the secrecy with which the campaign was being conducted, there was not the slightest chance of receiving the Commander-in-Chief's consent. I, of course, lost no time in accepting, and jumped at this opportunity of going on what I was sure would be an adventure of a lifetime. We were told that it would be practically impossible to make the journey overland from Palestine to Arabia, or, at any rate, that it could only be done by going through the Turkish lines in disguise. We had neither the time nor the inclination nor the necessary knowledge of the country and the language to attempt this. So, accompanied by Mr. Chase, my artist colleague, I returned to Egypt to consult the heads of the Arab Bureau in Cairo. There we were told, you can get as far as Aqaba at a cargo boat, but next to Timbuktu it is the most out-of-the-way place in the world. You will find no hotel porters at the dock to receive you, and you will have to be content with a block of coral for your pillow and a date palm for your shelter. 
In pre-war days, a tramp windjammer returning from Borneo or the Solomon Islands with a cargo of copra would occasionally lose its way in a storm and drive up the Gulf of Aqaba. But apart from rare occasions like that, almost no one had visited the place for a thousand years. You will get nothing to eat but unleavened bread, dates, and perhaps a few fried locusts, remarked one general, on whose advice we bought many little luxuries, including fifty bars of milk chocolate. A colonel cheerfully warned me, If you value your lives, take plenty of cigarettes for the meadows. So we filled every crevice of our outfit with gaspers, which proved worth their weight in sovereigns. On the day we landed in Arabia, the thermometer happened to register above the melting point of chocolate, and when I opened my kit bag, I found a semi-fluid mass of bullets, matches, cigarettes, pencils, notebooks, and chocolate. On our way to Arabia, we followed a roundabout route, sailing 1,500 miles up the Nile into the heart of Africa to Khartoum, and then across the Nubian Desert for 500 miles to Port Sudan on the Red Sea, where we hoped to get accommodation on a tramp vessel of some sort. Our first stop up the Nile was at Luxor, where we were given a welcome that had not been equaled since Teddy Roosevelt stopped there on his way back from hunting big game in East Africa. A swarm of haggard guides who had been waiting four long years in vain for American tourists mobbed us from sheer joy. Our welcome resembled a battle royale, and the runners from the Luxor Hotel eventually succeeded in dragging us into the ramshackle gari, and off we careened through streets lined with deserted tourist shops, with the rest of the crowd howling and gyrating behind us like dancing dervishes. Our visit to Hundred Gated Thebes, the Temple of Karnak, and the Tombs of the Kings the following day was rather spoiled by a pitiful tale that our guide poured into our ears. American tourist, he could no come no more. All we guides starve. Oh, woe, oh, woe, wailed this melancholy old Arab. Me guide here thirty-five years, and so help me Allah, the only real tourist in the world is you Americans. The English, English, German, and French spend all their time counting their centimes. If Americans see something he want, he say, how much? You tell him and praise he to Allah. No matter what price is, he say, all right, wrap her up. Allah's best guides specialize in Americans. Before the war, me no more bother guiding anybody but American than you bother to shoot baby elephant if you see big one. Why, President Wilson, no stop the war, and why, he added in a pleading voice, you Americans said money and food to Armenians, and nothing to us poor starving guides of Egypt. On the first evening after our arrival in Khartoum, we were dining with the chief of the Central African Intelligence Department at the house of the hippopotamus head, when suddenly I noticed his face turn pale. Glancing at the sky to the east, I saw the reason. Coming straight toward Khartoum was a great black wall that looked like a range of mountains moving down upon us. It was the dread Haboob, a terrific African sandstorm. The wood dinner party broke off abruptly, and the other guests raced for their homes. Jumping on a donkey which was awaiting me in the outer court, I made a dash for the Charles Gordon Hotel half a mile away. It was a glorious moonlight night, with stars twinkling radiantly all around to the north, west, and south. But straight ahead to the east, I could see that mountain wall of sand churning toward me. It looked as though the crack of doom were approaching. Soon it was only a few hundred yards away, and then it broke over us. Flying sand stung my face like needles and blinded me. Leaning forward over the neck of my diminutive mount, I tried to offer as little resistance to the storm as possible, but it was all we could do to fight our way against that whirling mass of sand and reach the hotel. The heat indoors was so unbearable that every one tried sleeping with the windows open, and the sand threatened to bury us, beds and all. When I closed the windows, the atmosphere was stifling, and the sand still swept in sheets through the crevices. The storm raged for hours. There was not a house in Khartoum that the sand did not penetrate. 
I have been through cyclones, cloudbursts, arctic blizzards, fierce gales in the southern ocean, monsoons, typhoons, and Sumatras, but none of them could hold a candle to that hubub. In Alaska, when a newcomer or Chichako remains in the far north through the long dark winter, he becomes a sourdough and is admitted to the fraternity of Arctic pioneers. In the Sudan, there is a similar saying that he who survives a hubub forthwith becomes a pucka African. But seventy below in the Yukon is preferable to one hundred above in a Sudanese hubub. One afternoon, a representative from the British intelligence officer took me a few miles distant from Khartoum to call on the holiest man in the Sudan. So rich had the natives grown from the war that they were refusing to sell their grain supplies, which were badly needed by the armies in Palestine and Arabia. I had expressed a desire to meet this holy man, and it occurred to the authorities that a visit from a foreigner might flatter him and put him in a sufficiently pleasant frame of mind to enable them to wheedle him into selling a store of grain, which would cause the other natives to follow suit. We set out in the governor's gary, a picturesque victory drawn by high-spirited white horses. Our driver was a wild-eyed fuzzy-wuzzy with a mop of crinkly hair full of mutton fat, with long wooden skewers sticking out at all angles. Off we galloped across the desert to the village of Barry, where we found Sharif Yusuf el Hindi, the holy man, awaiting us at the gate of his mud-brick palace. The Sharif, a tall, thin-faced man, distinguished-looking Arab with hypnotic eyes, garbed in sandals, a robe of green and white silk, and green turban, ushered us into his garden, where we were invited to review the most bewildering array of drinks that I had ever seen. There were concoctions of everything from pomegranate juice to slow gin, and from rose water to horse's neck. There were of every shade, from mauve to taupe. They were served in every sort of container, from cut glass tumblers to silver goblets. Fortunately, custom only required us to take a sip of each, otherwise the result would have been catastrophic, for many were of subtle potency. I remember that afternoon call as a series of surprises, of which the first was the beauty of the garden inside the ugly adobe outer walls of the Sharif's palace. The second was the variety of fluid refreshment placed before us. Surely Sharif who Yusuf El Hindi must have won the genie from the Arabian Nights mixing drinks in his palace. Even in pre-prohibition days, when assigned to cover a national college fraternity convention, Never was I invited to pass through such an ordeal by drink as I faced at Sharif Yusuf El Hindi's oasis. The third surprise came when I saw the attractive interior of his palace as we passed through on our way to a Moorish balcony near the roof, where we were confronted with another relay of drinks. But the climax came when I discovered that my host, instead of being an African witch doctor, was a savant of wide learning. His library even contained Arabic translations of the speeches of Lloyd George, Lord Balfour, Theodore Roosevelt, and Woodrow Wilson. In fact, I found that this Sudanese holy man knew more about the history of my own country than I did. We discussed religion, and I was impressed by his spirit of tolerance. I believe, as do all Muslims who deserve to be called educated, said he, that the fundamental principles underlying the world's greatest religions, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, and Mohammedanism, are the same, that there is but one God and that he is supreme, that we should be tolerant to the opinions of others, that all men should live together as brothers and do unto others as we would have others do unto us. It was not difficult to understand why Sharif Yusuf El Hindi was looked upon as a holy man by his ignorant, half civilized fellow countrymen. His princely manners, his dignity and poise, his musical, bell like voice, his large, lustrous, hypnotic brown eyes, and his wisdom would have won him distinction in any country. He is not an Ethiopian, but is a descendant of the Arabian tribe of Koresh to which Mohammed belonged. Being a holy man of the Sudan is a lucrative profession, 
Sharif Yusuf El Hindi spends most of his time naming babies. When a child is born, the father comes running to him, prostrates himself at the Sharif's feet, and says, O oh, noble one, what name shall I bestow upon my child? Whereupon the holy man rises and replies, O oh, faithful one, arise, go thy way, and return again upon the morrow. Then, when the father returns the next day, the Sharif intones, Allah be praised. In a vision last night, the prophet appeared and revealed his, revealed to me that your faith should be rewarded and your child blessed with the name of his own daughter, Fatima. Five dollars, please. From Khartoum, we crossed the Nubian Desert to Port Sudan on the Red Sea. Here, as we had hoped, we found a tramp steamer bound for the Arabian coast. She was a much torpedoed cargo boat, which had been transferred from the British Indian Coastal Service to the Mediterraneans, where, during the first years of the war, she had survived several harrowing years serving as a target for the Kaiser's U-boats. On board with us were 226 Sudanese sheep, 150 horses and mules from America and Australia, 67 donkeys from Abyssinia, 98 deserters from the Turkish army, 82 Egyptian Falihin laborers, 34 Gordon Highlanders, 6 British officers, and 2 obsolete aeroplanes. Our crew consisted of Hindus, Javanese, Somalis, Berberines, and Fugsy Wugsies. The skipper of this modern ark was a rotund and jovial Scotch Irishman by the name of Rose. I don't know, I doubt whether Captain Kidd in his palmiest days of Caribbean piracy ever put to sea with such a motley cargo and crew. The different nationalities on board segregated themselves into little racial colonies and did their own cooking in various parts of the main deck. It would be impossible to imagine what the good ship Ozarda looked like after we'd been at sea for a few days and what she smelled like. Some of the Sudanese were from the Nubian desert, where it is difficult enough to get water for drinking purposes, to say nothing of water for bathing. Some of them had never had a real bath in their lives. But there was one of them whom the Highlanders nicknamed Bathing Bert. This man insisted on having his tub out of a bucket five times each day. The Egyptian laborers entertained us incessantly with their fantastic ceremonial dances. There was not room enough for all of them to dance at a time, and so they went at it in relays. Some of them danced until they collapsed on the deck from exhaustion. Fainting, to them, was merely a sign that their spirits had been transported to heaven for a few minutes' sojourn with the Almighty. There was no passenger accommodation, so that we had to sleep out on the deck with the donkeys and mules. I bunked beside a mouse-colored mule from Hannibal, Missouri, the home of Mark Twain. She was very pessimistic. She seemed to be worrying about something back home and didn't sleep well. Neither did I. Mark Twain would have lost his sense of humor if he'd been in my place. We had a British officer on board who was bound for the Persian Gulf. He was laboring under the erroneous impression that he had fallen heir to the mantle of George Roby or Harry Lauder. He used to tell a story until we were almost bored to extinction. I'm going to repeat one of his tales, not because I think it's funny, but because I know it is not funny. I want to show you the sort of thing we had to endure. He said that he was out hunting lions once in Central Africa. None of us doubted that, for he had knocked about all over the world from Kamchatka to the Cameroons. He said that one day a lion jumped at him out of the bath, or, sorry, out of the bush, that he ducked just in time, causing the lion to go right over his head. Some minutes passed, and as the lion failed to return, he crawled along on his stomach to reconnoiter. Coming to an open space, he peered cautiously through the tall grass, and there he saw that same lion practicing low jumps. One day we hit upon the idea of giving cigarettes to the Turkish deserters, who could only understand a few words of English in order to get them to listen in in two stories. They would laugh when he laughed, and it satisfied him, and 
certainly relieved the rest of us. When we finally arrived at the ancient and long-deserted seaport of King Solomon at the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, our ark anchored half a mile offshore. We eventually pushed off, bound for the distant fringe of palm trees at the base of King Solomon's mountains, on board a lighter loaded down with donkeys and mules. One unlucky donkey was kicked overboard by a nervous mule. Immediately, two sharks appeared and attacked him fore and aft. One seized a front leg and the other the poor donkey's rump, and literally they pulled him in two. We were told by the skipper of our ark that there was never sharks in the Red Sea than in any other waters of the globe. When we grounded on the coral beach, we were greeted by several thousand Bedouins who welcomed us by blazing into the air with their rifles and pistols. This firing had begun when we were still afar off and Mr. Chase and I thought we were arriving in the midst of a battle. So fantastic and full of color was that palm fringe coral shore, and so picturesque were the Bedouins with their flowing beards, their gorgeous robes, their strange headdress, and their array of cynical, ancient and modern weapons of every sort that it all seemed like some bizarre oriental pageant. So indeed it was, and these were some of Colonel Lawrence's modern Arabian nights. King Solomon's long-forgotten port had been turned into a great base camp, and enormous piles of supplies lay stacked in the sand and under the palms. Several of the British officers who were in charge of the receiving of supplies at Alaska, or at Aqaba, took us to a nearby tent and slaked our growing thirst. And a few hours later, Lawrence himself came down the Wadi Itham, returning from one of his mysterious expeditions into the blue. With Lawrence, no two days in the desert were ever the same, so it would be impossible to describe a typical one. But the camp routine at the headquarters of the Arabian army, with no Gazu, a raid was in progress, followed some such program as this, at 5 a.m., as the first rays of dawn fell on the Judge Peaks of Sinai, the army imam would climb the highest sand dune and give the morning call to prayer. He was a chap with such astounding vocal powers that his nasal chant woke every man and animal in Aqaba. Immediately after he had finished calling the Arabian proletariat, Emir Faisal's private imam would softly intone their morning call at the door of his tent. Praise be to Allah, who makes day succeed the night. Miss Gertrude Bell, the famous Syrian traveler, whom, although a woman, served on the intelligence staff in the Near East during the war, has written a vivid description of the glorious intonation and intoxication of a desert morning. To wake in the desert dawn is like walking in the heart of an opal. To my mind, the saying about the Bay of Naples should run differently. See the desert on a fine morning and die if you can. Surely a fascinating creature. And a fascinating book of adventure and romance could be written about the wartime experience of Miss Bell in the Mesopotamian desert. As a staff officer, she did everything required of any man but wear a spine pad and shorts. A few minutes after the call to prayer had aroused the camp, a cup of sweetened coffee would turn up, brought in by one of Faisal's slaves. The emir had five young Abyssinian blacks, slaves who were the acme of fidelity, because the emir did not treat them as slaves, nor regard them as such. Whatever one of them desired money, Faisal ordered him to help himself to whatever he needed from his bag of gold. No matter what was taken, he never complained. And as a result, the thought of robbing never seemed to occur to them. At 6 a.m., Lawrence was in the habit of breakfasting with Faisal in the emir's tent, squatting Bedouin fashion on an old Baluchi prayer rug. Breakfast on lucky days included a mini-layered pastry of richly spiced puffed bread, called Masameka pastry, and cooked dura, 
a small round white seed. Then, of course, there were the inevitable dates. After breakfast, little glasses of sweetened tea were produced. From then until 8 a.m., Lawrence would discuss the possible events of the day, either with the British officers or with some of the more prominent Arab leaders. At that time, Faisal worked with his secretary or talked over private affairs in his tent with Lawrence. At 8 a.m., Faisal would hold court and grant audience in the Duan tent. According to the regular procedure, it was customary for the emir to sit at the end of a great rug on a dais. Collars or petitioners sat in front of the seat and in front of the tent in a half circle until they were called up. All questions were settled similarly, and nothing was left over. One morning I was in the tent with Lawrence when a young Bedouin was hauled in, charged with having the evil eye. Faisal was not present. Lawrence ordered the offender to sit at the opposite side of the tent and look at him. Then for ten minutes he regarded him with steady gaze, his steel blue eyes seeming to bore a hole into the culprit's very soul. At the end of the ten minutes Lawrence dismissed the Bedouin. The evil spell had been driven off by the grace of Allah. Another day, a member of Lawrence's bodyguard came to him with a complaint that one of his companions possessed the evil eye. Said he, O oh, sea of justice, yonder fellow looked at my camel, and straight away it went lame. Lawrence settled this difficulty by putting the man charged with the evil eye on the lame camel, and giving the defendant's camel to the man who brought up the charge. Blue eyes terrify the average Arab. Lawrence possesses two that are bluer than the waters of the Mediterranean. And so the Bedouins decided there was something superhuman about him. They themselves nearly all have eyes like black velvet. Whenever Faisal was present, Lawrence would step aside and decline to decide disputes. He had no ambition to become the ruler of Arabia himself, and he knew that it would be far better for the future of the Arabs and for Emir Faisal if their differences were handled in the usual way by one of their own people. In fact, Lawrence never did anything himself that he could delegate to an Arab who was capable of handling it successfully. Usually at 11.30 a.m., Faisal arose and walked back to his living tent, where a little lunch would be served. Lawrence, in the meantime, would spend half an hour or so reading the inevitable Aristophanes, or a favorite English poet. He carried three books all through the campaign. The Oxford Book of English Verse, Mallory's Mort de Arthur, and Aristophanes which shows his Catholic taste. Lunch usually consisted of dishes such as stewed thorn buds, lentils, unleavened bread cooked in the sand, and rice or honey cakes. I ate with a spoon, although the Arabs used their fingers, as did Lawrence. After lunch, there followed a short relay of general talk, rounding out the conversation of the luncheon hour, and in the meantime, black bitter coffee and sweetened tea would be served. In drinking tea and coffee, the tribesmen would make as much noise as possible. It is the polite way of indicating that you are enjoying your drink. The emir would then dictate letters to an Arab scribe or enjoy a siesta, while Lawrence, absorbed in Wordsworth or Shelley, squatted on a prayer rug in his own tent. If there were afternoon cases to be disposed of, Sharif Lawrence or Sharif Faisal would again hold court in the reception tent. From 5 until 6 p.m., Faisal would usually grant private audiences, and at such times Lawrence sat with him, since the discussion nearly always would have to do with the night's reconnaissance and future military operations. Meanwhile, behind the servant's tent, a fire would be started with a pile of thorns. Another sheep's throat would be cut in the name of Allah, the merciful and compassionate, and put on to roast. At 6 p.m. would come the evening meal, much like lunch, but with large fragments of mutton crowning the rice heap, after which would follow intermittent cups of tea until bedtime, which for Lawrence was never any fixed hour. At night, Lawrence would have many of his most important consultations with the Arab leaders, but occasionally Faisal would entertain his intimate associates with stories of his adventures in Syria and Turkey during the eighteen years when his family lived at the sublime port under the wary eye of the Red Sultan. The rest of us would often read well into the night. Before leaving Egypt, I had picked up second-hand copies of the records of a few great Arabian travelers such as Burckhardt, Burton, and Doughty. With the exception of Doughty's monumental masterpiece, 
I found none of the books in my haphazard collection more fascinating than Miss Bell's The Desert and the Sown. My interest in it was stimulated by the stories which Colonel Lawrence related to me of the wartime adventures of the brilliant authoress. This extraordinary Englishwoman had been wandering about remote corners of the Near East for a number of years prior to the war. She was a scholar and a scientist, not an idle traveler in quest of notoriety. With a lone Arab companion or two, she had trekked for hundreds of miles along the fringe of the great Arabian desert, visiting the wild tribes and studying their language and customs. So vast was her knowledge that the heads of the British Intelligence Department in Mesopotamia asked her to accept a staff appointment, and she played no small part in winning the friendship of some of the most bloodthirsty tribesmen residing in the Tigris and Euphrates valleys. In her book, The Desert and the Sown, Miss Bell throws much interesting light on the life of the desert dwellers. The fortunes of the Arab are as varied as those of a gambler on the stock exchange. One day he is the richest man of the desert, and the next morning he may not have a single camel full to his name. He lives in a state of war, and even if the surest pledges have been exchanged with the neighboring tribes, there is no certainty that a band of raiders from hundreds of miles away will not descend on his camp in the night. As a tribe unknown to Syria, the Beni Roger fell two years on the land southeast of Aleppo, crossing three hundred miles of desert. Marduf, two on a camel, from their seat of a Baghdad, carrying off all the cattle and killing scores of people. How many thousand years this state of thing has lasted! Those who shall read the earliest records of the inner desert will tell us, for it goes back to the first of them, but in all the centuries the Arab has bought no wisdom from experience. He is never safe, and yet he behaves as though security were his daily bread. He pitches his feeble little camps, ten or fifteen tents together, over a wide stretch of undefended and indefensible country. He is too far from his fellows to call in their aid, too far as a rule to gather the horsemen together and follow after the raiders, whose retreat must be sufficiently slow, burdened with the captured flocks, to guarantee success to a swift pursuit. Having lost all his worldly goods, he goes about the desert and makes his plaint, and one man gives him a strip or two of goat's hair cloth, and another a coffee pot, a third presents him with a camel, and a fourth with a few sheep, till he has a roof to cover him and enough animals to keep his family from hunger. There are good customs among the Arabs, as Namrud said, so he bides his time for months, perhaps for years, until at length opportunity ripens, and the horsemen of his tribe with their allies ride forth to recapture all the flocks that have been carried off, and more besides, and the feud enters another phase. The truth is that the Gazu, raid, is the only industry the desert knows, and the only game. As an industry, it seems to be the commercial mind to be based on a false conception of the laws of supply and demand. But as a game, there is much to be said for it. The spirit of adventure finds full scope in it. You can picture the excitement of the night ride across the plain, the rush of the mares and the attack, the glorious popping of rifles, and the exhilaration of knowing yourself a fine fellow as you turn homewards with the spoil. It is the best sort of fantasia, as they say in the desert, with the spikes of danger behind it. Not that the danger is alarmingly great. A considerable amount of amusement can be got without much bloodshed, and the raiding Arab is seldom bent on killing. He never lifts his hand against women and children, and if here and there a man falls, it is almost by accident, since who can be sure of the ultimate destination of a rifle bullet once it is embarked on its lawless course. This is the Arab view of the Gazu. Chapter 10 The Battle of Selassa As they pushed northward from the head of the Gulf of Aqaba, the Hija forces were joined by the Benjazi Hawatat and the Beni Sakir, two of the best fighting tribes of the whole Arabian desert. About the same day, the Juena, the Ataba, and the Anaze came riding in on their camels to join Faisal and Lawrence. After the fall of Aqaba, Lawrence had made several trips to Palestine to confer with Allenby. From that time, the British in Palestine and King Hussein's army were in close cooperation. The Arab army had been divided into two distinct parts, one known as regulars and the other as irregulars. The regulars were all infantrymen. There were not more than 20,000 of them. 
and they were either deserters from the Turkish army or men of Arab blood who had been fighting under the Sultan's flag and who had volunteered to join the forces of King Hussein after being taken prisoner by the British in Mesopotamia or in Palestine. At first they were used mainly for garrisoning old Turkish posts captured by the advancing Sharifian horde. Later on, after they had been thoroughly trained, they were used as stormtroops in attacking fortified positions. The Arab regulars were under an Irishman, Colonel P.C. Joyce, who, next to Lawrence, perhaps played a more important part in the Arabian campaign than any other non-Muslim. The irregulars, who were by far the most numerous, were Bedouins mounted on camels and horses. In all, Lawrence had now over 200,000 fighting men available. The Battle of Sail el Isa illustrates the manner in which he handled King Hussein's forces. A Turkish regiment, under the command of Hamid Fakri Bey, composed of infantry, cavalry, mountain artillery, and machine gun squads, was sent over the Hijaz Railway from Karak, southeast of the Dead Sea, to recapture the town of Tafila, which had fallen into the hands of the Arabian army. The Turkish regiment had been hurriedly formed in the Haran and Daman, and was short of supplies. When the Turks came in contact with the Bedouin patrols at Sale el Hassa, they drove them back into the town of Tafila. Lawrence and his Sharifian staff had laid out a defensive position on the south bank of the Great Valley in which Tafila stands, and Sharif Zaid, youngest of the four sons of King Hussein, occupied that position during the night with 500 regulars and irregulars. At the same time, Lawrence sent most of the baggage of his army off in another direction, and all the natives of the town thought the Arab army was running away. I think they were, Lawrence remarked to me. Tefila was seething with excitement. Sheikh Diab el Aran, the amateur Sherlock of the Hijah, had brought in reports of growing dissatisfaction among the villagers and rumors of treachery. So Lawrence went down from his housetop before dawn into the crowded streets to do a bit of necessary eavesdropping. Dressed in his voluminous robes, he had no difficulty in concealing his identity in the dark. There was much criticism of King Hussein, and the populace was not over-respectful. Everyone was screaming with terror, and the town of Tefila was in a state of tumult. Homes were being speedily vacated, and goods were being bundled through the lattice windows into the crowded streets. Mounted Arabs were galloping up and down, firing wildly into the air and through the palm branches. With each flash of the rifles, the cliffs of Tafila Gorge stood out in momentary relief, sharp and clear against the topaz sky. Just at dawn, the enemy bullets began to fall, and Lawrence went out to Sharif Zaid and persuaded him to send one of his officers with two fusil miltrayur to support the Arab villagers, who were still holding the southern crest of the foothills. The arrival of the machine gunners revived their spirits and stimulated the Arabs to attack again. With a mighty shout calling upon the Prophet of God, they drove the Turks over another ridge and across a small plain to the Wadi al -Assa. They took the ridge, but were, told, were held up there and found the main body of Hamid Fakhri's Turkish army posted just behind it. The fighting became hotter now. On both sides, men were dropping thickly. Continuous bursts of machine gun fire and heavy shelling checked the ardor of the Arabs. Zaid hesitated to send forward his reserves, and so Lawrence hurriedly rode to the north of Tafila for reinforcements. On his way, he met his machine gunners returning. Five true believers had been sent to paradise. One gun had exploded, and they were out of ammunition. Lawrence sent back urgent messages to Zaid to rush forward a mountain gun, more ammunition, and all other available machine guns to one of his reserve positions at the southern end of the little plain between El Hasa and Tafila Valley. Then Lawrence galloped back to his front line on the ridge, where he found things in a precarious state. The ridge was being held by just thirty Benjazi habitat, mounted men and a handful of villagers. He could see the enemy working through the pass and along the eastern boundary to the ridge of the plain, where twenty Turkish machine guns were concentrating their fire. An attempt was being made to flank the ridge which the Arabs were holding. The German officers directing the Turks were also correcting the fusing of the shrapnel, which had been grazing the top of the hill and bursting harmlessly over the desert plain. 
As Lauren sat there, they began to spray the sides and top of the hill with steel splinters and with startling results, and he knew that the loss of the position was but a matter of minutes. A squadron of albatross scouts flew up and helped to minimize the chances of the Sharifian forces by bombing them heavily from the air. Lawrence gave his Motalga horsemen all the cartridges that he could collect, and the Arabs on foot ran back over the plain. He was among them. Since he had come straight up the cliffs from Tefila, his animals had not caught up with him. The mounted men held out for fifteen minutes more and then galloped back unhurt. Lawrence collected his men in the reserve position on a ridge about sixty feet high, commanding an excellent view of the plain. It was now about noon. He had lost fifteen men and had only eighty left, but a few minutes later several hundred Agail and some of his other men with the Hotchkiss automatic submachine gun came up. Let Fielasli Assyrian arrived with two more machine guns, and Lawrence held his own until three o'clock, when Sharif Zabe came up with mountain artillery and more machine guns, and with fifty cavalrymen and two hundred Arabs on foot. Meanwhile, the Turks had occupied his old front lines. Fortunately, Lawrence had their exact range. He had coolly paced it off while his followers were retreating, pell-mell to their reserve position. He then rushed all his artillery to the top of the ridge and dispatched the cavalry to the right to work up beyond the eastern boundary ridge. These mounted men were fortunate enough to get forward without being seen until they had turned the Turkish flank at 2,000 yards. There they made a dismounted attack, dancing forward with white puffs of smoke rippling from their rifles. Meanwhile, more than a hundred Arabs of the Aimee tribe, who had refused to fight the previous day because they were not satisfied with the amount of loot they were receiving, came up and joined Lawrence. There are few Bedouins who can resist the temptation to participate in a good fight when they see one coming on. He sent them to his left flank, and they crept down behind the western ridge of the plain to within two hundred yards of the Turkish Maxims. The ridge which the Turks occupied at the time was of a flint-like rock so that entrenchment was impossible. The ricochets of the shells and shrapnel as they struck the flint boulders and glanced off were horrible, causing heavy losses among the enemy. Lawrence ordered the men on his left flank to fire an unusually heavy burst from their Hotchkiss and Vickers machine guns at the Turks, manning the Maxims. These were so accurate that they completely wiped the latter out. Then he ordered his cavalry to charge the retreating Turks from the right flank, while he also moved forward to the center with his infantry and banners waving defiantly. Horse and man, the Turks collapsed and their attack crumpled. At the sun's decline, Lawrence occupied the Turkish lines and chased the enemy back past their guns into the Hassa Valley. It was dark before his followers gave up the pursuit, exhausted from lack of sleep and food. Allahu Akbar, cried the weary men as they fell upon their knees with their faces toward Mecca, giving praise to Allah for their victory. Lawrence had put to flight a whole Turkish regiment. Amongst the slain lay Hamid Fakri.